And we are in the class, The Christ Life and the Crucified Life. <clears throat> and on the board, I have five things. Number one, your life. Number two, the Christian life. Y'all see that? Number three, the committed life. Number four, the Christ life. And number five, the crucified life. So we want to discuss these, and we want to discuss the difference in relationship to them. Um, and we're going to do that out of Matthew 26. And we'll start with verse 1. And as we uh, read this, <coughs> Matthew 26, and we're going to read um, all the way down to verse 16. And as we read this, I would like for you to think of the different characters in here in relationship to these five things. Somebody or somebody's being, you know, whatever. And even though it says your life, you might be able to identify you in there, possibly. Um, the Christian life, the committed life, the Christ life, and the crucified life. <clears throat> All right, so verse 1. And it came to pass, when Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said unto his disciples, You know that after two days is the feast of the Passover, and the Son of Man is, be is betrayed to be crucified. <clears throat> then assembled together the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the people unto the palace of the high priest who was called Caiaphas and consulted that they might take Jesus by subtuity. What is it? Sorry, I know that. I don't know why I don't, didn't get that. Subtly and kill him. So they're not going to kill him subtly. <laughs> yeah, take note. Uh, and consulted that they might uh, take Jesus subtly and kill him. But they said, not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar among the people. Now when Jesus was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, there came unto him a woman having an alabaster box of precious ointment and poured it on his head as he sat at meat. And when his disciples saw it, they had indignation, saying, To what purpose is this waste? For this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. When Jesus understood it, he said unto them, Why trouble ye the woman? For she hath wrought a good work upon me. For ye have the poor always with you, but me ye have not always. For in that she hath poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, there shall, there shall also this, that this woman hath done, be told for a memorial of her. <clears throat> Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went unto the chief priests and said unto them, What will you give me, and I will deliver him unto you? And they covenanted with him for thirty pieces of silver, and from that time he sought opportunity to betray him. Now we actually have a lot of um, players in this uh, scene. And... Um, not all of them fit into the categories that we have here, but what we're going to do is we're going to try to see if we can find a category, if necessary, for each person. Okay. Um, let's start with uh, verse 3. <clears throat> then assembled together the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the people. Um, and included in that is Caiaphas. Okay, so what category would you put put uh, the chief priests and Caiaphas? Your life, the Christian life, the committed life, 
I'm sorry, the, the, yeah, the Christian life, the committed life, the Christ life, or the crucified life. Anybody? Lindsay? The Christian life, okay. I can, I can see that because we're trying to look at this in relationship to our uh, story, if you will. Scott? The committed one, okay. Anybody else? Kelly? Your life, as in your old nature, all right? So we'll talk about all this in just a little bit, but we're going to just go down our list here. Like I said, we've got a lot of players here. Um, verse 6, now when Jesus was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, okay, so let's talk about Simon the leper. Where would he fit in? Anybody? Right, can I say this at this point? Um, there are no wrong answers, only stupid ones. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, we're, just, we're just exploring this, and I don't even know if I know the right answer. So, uh, yeah. Your life. So you are Simon the leper. Or you're saying, I am, your life. <laughs> All right, thank, thank you, Kelly. You're dismissed now. Uh, Lindsay? Okay, yeah. Okay. Okay, Mallory, what do you think? Okay. She was saying the committed life because she was letting Jesus into her home, into his home on, on certain level, on some level. So, I mean, I think that has validity. I think most of the things that I've heard from you have validity, even if some of you have had different answers. They still had some validity in our story that we're trying to paint here so that it's, it's fine. Okay. Um, Uh, verse 7, there came unto him a woman having an alabaster box of very precious ointment and poured it on his head as he sat at meat. So what about uh, Mary of Bethany? Anybody? How does she fit in here? Scott? The crucified life. Okay. Anyone else? Jason says the Christ life. Good. Lindsay, the Christ life. All right. Anybody else? Deb, you got something? Okay. Crucified life. All right. Um, verse eight uh, and nine. But when his disciples saw it, they had indignation, saying, "To what purpose is this waste? For this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor." Where do the disciples fit in? Carol? The Christian life, okay. Anybody else? Kelly? The committed life, okay. Same Lindsay, okay. Anybody different? Okay. All right. Scott? Well, that's the purpose of this class tonight. <laughs> we shall get into it once we get done with uh, this foolishness that we're doing. <clears throat> Actually, I mean, it, I think it, it's helping us to at least start seeing differences, and that's important. The, the rest of the class will be to help us really be able to identify the differences. Okay, uh, verse 10, when Jesus understood it, he said unto them, why trouble ye the woman for she hath wrought a good work upon me, for ye have the poor always with you. Where do the poor fit into this? Jason? What, which one? Your life? Yeah. Definitely mine, trust me. <laughs> yeah. It's clearly my life. <laughs> Uh, which reminds me, Chris, I need to talk to you after class. 
uh, and know, know you're not in trouble. Um, so the poor you have with you always, but me you have not with you always. Uh, for the in that she hath poured this ointment on my body. Okay, so the body of Christ, where does that fit in? Okay, the Christian life, the Christ life, Kelly, okay, all right, all right, so let's, um, let's look at some of these differences now, who's that? Okay, where which one? Where does Jesus fit on here, Deb? Are you sure? Okay, verse uh, verse one and two. And it came to pass when Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said unto his disciples, "Ye know that after two days is the feast of the Passover, and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified." Now that's an interesting phrase it's so familiar to us that it's not an interesting phrase but many of the times when the lord starts talking about being betrayed or going to give his life and stuff he doesn't use the word crucified i mean think about it he doesn't he just you know but this says he will be is betrayed to be crucified all right, so Deb, you're thinking it's the, which one? It's the crucified life, okay. That's, that's good. <laughs> I'm just checking, because I don't know either, but I'm trying to find out. But since that verse said, <laughs> all right. So we have, we have our life, we have the Christian life, we have the committed life, we have the Christ life, and we have the crucified life. Now, <clears throat> we want to start with our life, okay? Our life. Our life before we're born again is our life. Now, we would say, uh, I could have written up here, uh, sinner so that you were clued as to this being pre-born again. But I used your life, and I am referring to pre-born again. But um, in some ways, I don't think it's uh, proper to just say a sinner. Because first of all, that like justifies everybody who's in sin. I mean, it just says, that, well, they're a sinner, and it, you know, it categorizes them as you're a person that sins or, or, you know, in that thing. But in fact, it's really your life that sins. I mean, sure. and you'll stand before God for it. You can say, well, I was just a sinner, you know what I mean? But that was your life. And, um, you know, I think that part of this, I mean, part of it, even being born again is to take responsibility for your life prior to the Lord. Amen? It's called repentance. Right? You know? So, it's your life. And the thing, uh, obviously, sin will be a part of that, but sin will be the fruit of your life. Also, uh, what else do we have? We, uh, we've got a... Um, Instead of saying a self-centered life before Christ, we could say, well, let's go ahead and say a self-centered life, okay? A life that is centered on yourself, okay? So <clears throat> we understand that. We've been born again. But then there's the Christian life. The Christian life. The Christian life. Uh, how do we define that? I mean, we can define it in terms of one, one section. 
we can define that in terms of rituals. Uh, and when I say rituals, what I mean is uh, going to a building to worship, reading a book to learn more about deity, um, praying, uh, giving. Um, but none of those things in themselves is holy because just about every religion in the world does that, you know. And a lot of them do it a lot more than you do. Amen. <laughs> you know, a Buddhist probably got you beat hands down, you know. Yes, Scott? I'm sorry. Religious but carnal. I think so. I think so because um, the basic term, the Christian life, really doesn't go anywhere near the cross except to get saved. And that like, is, the, is like the gap between the Christian life and your life. But, the, but it, um, it holds to certain beliefs, right? The Christian life, it has its own belief system. And it holds as much as possible to those beliefs. Now, you know and I know there's a difference between what you live and what you believe. You can believe all kind of stuff and not live it, you know. And I would venture to say that my handwriting is darker than Kelly's when she wrote this up here. Uh, and I don't know why that's, that's on in our discussion here, but it is. The Lord pointed it out to me when I was talking just now. So. Okay, so <clears throat> the Christian life, there are tons of Christians all over this country. I mean, all over the world. And um, a lot of them don't agree with one another. A lot of them have, uh, you could say a lot of them have a, May I say this? A self-centric life. Okay? So when they go to church, most of them choose a church that they like. They have a coffee bar. Oh, the pastor dresses cool. There's flashy lights during worship. You understand what I'm saying? And we have... Um, you know, we have this or we have that or whatever. So I'm drawn to that church, not necessarily because I know I'm going to get the Lord, but it's got to be really good because all these people go to it, okay? So, it's, so that's our thinking. And all of that thinking primarily has to do with us and what we like in the flesh. It just does. It does. So then we get involved with that church, and, um, you know, so after a while, the pastor or somebody comes up and says, hey, would you like to get, be involved with the church? And we say, sure. And uh, so they might even do this. I, I don't know. They used to do it a lot more. They give you a little paper to fill out so that they can find out if you're sanguine, what is it, sanguine, metatarsal, Thank you for laughing. Uh, whatever all those things are. And so what that means is they're going to find out exactly what fits you. Really? Do you want to find out what fits you? I thought we're trying to get away from, you know, what fits me. I want to know what Christ wants. So we're, we're doing that. And then, but, but if they say, well, you look like you're going to fit real good as a Christian Working, um, working in the infant room. And you might go, hmm, that's just not me. <laughs> well, it would be if you would, you know, but. So there's, so there's a whole lot concerning what we call Christianity, and notice my wording, what we call Christianity that um, is self-centric, which, by the way, is really the same word as self-centered with your life before you met Jesus. 
I just changed the words so you'd be impressed. It's really the same thing. It's just being self-centered. But I'm self-centered for my Christian life now. Okay? And that's okay because it's okay because Christianity goes that way, moves that way. This is, this is the way that it is, you know. <clears throat> and um, so, so then uh, the committed life. This, you know, this is a, <clears throat> this is kind of a wide area in the sense that you could have someone who would be committed to uh, teaching the children uh, and they would be consistent, therefore committed. I mean, wouldn't we say consistency might, we might call that committed. However, can you, can you accept that a person who might be consistent in some, some area of ministry might just be consistent because they like it personally. I mean, I'm on the, I've been on the worship team for 100 years, and you know why? Well, because I just like music or whatever. Is, you know, that's, not, that's not really committed unless it's committed to self. I mean, am I right or wrong? I mean, you're, just, you're committed to what you like, and I, I like this, so I'm going to be there, okay? And, you know, if I stub my toe and it hurts, I won't be there or whatever. But I will be there when everything falls into place. <clears throat> so committed can actually move all the way to a missionary who, who goes to darkest Africa or the poorest parts of India, and they go there and they are uh, given as much as they can to help those people to win souls. Um, they are indeed committed to the Lord. And what they do, they do for the Lord. Did you catch that last statement? What they do, they do for the Lord. Okay? So, I mean, my wife and I have been missionaries. We were actually had to come back because the country we were missionaries in went communist and wouldn't renew our visa. But when we went, uh, I'll just say for their sake that we were committed. Okay, it was a little more than that. But we were committed to that country and that people. And in our minds, we went there for the rest of our life. Now, you know, Nowadays, and back then, I don't even think they had, had uh, uh, short-term missions. That came, on, came along later. The missionaries that were missionaries went, and they, they went there to lay down their life. They went to give, you know, to, to be committed to the Lord for the rest of their life. Um, and our experience, we saw people come and they wanted to be missionaries and go because it was too hard for their life. It seems that your life keeps creeping up in these things. Have you noticed that? Even if you're no longer just a sinner, your life keeps slipping into being a Christian or being committed <clears throat> and making decisions. Making decisions that are not yours to make and f for the reasons that will follow. They're not yours to make. Now, what are we saying? Um, is there some sort of control put over people when you say that? No, no, it's just not. It, we're, we're bought with a price. If, you, if, I, if I don't go any deeper than that, we're not our own. We're bought with a price. The scripture says that. And that one is a scripture that is used a lot for the committed life. Do you understand? Okay. So it's on the premise of a true belief that I'm not my own. And therefore, and I'm just using a missionary as an example of it, but I think it's a good example. Therefore, uh, since I'm not my own, 
and I've been bought with a price, and it was Jesus' death, then I am going to stay here, and I'm going to serve the Lord here. All right. Again, that's, that's admirable. It's true. But every, every bit of that's still outside of you. I mean, your commitment level is based on <clears throat> if, if you hear that they're going to, you know, the rebels are going to sweep in and kill everybody in the village, you might hop the first plane out of town, you know. Because there's no reason for you to die or shed your blood there. Um, your commitment is over. It, the village has been overrun, and I'm leaving town, or I'm leaving the country. But there are deeper things, deeper things that are supposed to move us, and they have to be deeper than our, uh, our the change, quote unquote, from your life to the Christian life can be nothing more than, you know, well, I made some good changes in my life. I don't drink anymore, you know. I don't, you know, I don't go to the bar. I don't do, you know, whatever. I, you know, I'm just trying to throw stuff out there. I don't do that anymore. And that, that's from this stage of your life before Christ to the Christian life, a lot of it is based on and testimonies are based on I don't do that anymore okay my life doesn't do that anymore didn't say my life's gone just says it doesn't do that anymore are you following now because we're we're falling deeper into this we're falling deeper and Scott Right. 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 Um, Scott was saying about, you hear a lot of people saying, you know, they would, they would give their testimony. Uh, you know, I've heard a lot of testimonies in my lifetime. And, uh, you know, a lot of it is, is, true thanksgiving the Lord did this for me the Lord saved me from this horrible thing that was going to happen <clears throat> very much sincere sincerity but again ultimately the father wants more out of us than just sincerity you know um and testimonies of what the invisible God can do. I mean, you, I'm jumping ahead a little bit here, but you do realize that we're the body of Christ. And the whole purpose of a body is to be able to manifest the person that's in there. That's the purpose of it. You manifest that person that's in there. What the thoughts, the, the words, the, see, I mean, you, you got a brain for thoughts, you've got a mouth for words, you've got hands for doing certain things and all of this, and it's a manifestation of that person. Well, that's all shadow land. The real world is the reality that we are the body of Christ. And that's not a, that's not a statement that we make um, you know, for example, I've heard people say, well, this great body here, you know, talking about all the people, <clears throat> um, with only the fact that there's a whole bunch of people there and they're Christians. Understand what I said? There's a lot of people there in this great body of Christians. Well, there is no real... Uh, main thing about that in that form as much as it is we are the vehicle of the life and the nature 
of Jesus so that he might live. So that automatically marks out your life, right? Okay, so since I jumped ahead, we'll move from the committed life, but <clears throat> um, so let's go to the Christ life. Okay, now as we look at the term the Christ life, I want to um, just use the word Christ in this little phrase here as sort of a, uh, a title, the way most people use it. The most people use Christ as either his name, you know, his first name's Christ, or Jesus, and his last name's Christ. You know, what's your middle name? You know, Jesus, the Christ, I don't know. But, you know, it's, uh, so I want to just use in this phrase, the Christ life on number four, I just want the, the term Christ not to represent all that it represents, but the normal way that most Christians see it is just like a title for Jesus or a name for Jesus, the Christ life, okay? So in doing that, and that may be hard for some of you to do that, but it is, <clears throat> what it is, is for some Christians, this becomes a stepping ladder to greater things in the Lord. They begin to move down and move into more areas. So the way we're describing this now is that number four, the Christ life, which is also the title of this, <clears throat> would represent the reality that comes to a person after he's been a Christian or committed or whatever for a period of time, and he realizes that it is Christ in him. Okay, can we go with that? Christ in him. It's the Christ life that's in me, or the life of Christ. That's, that's why I'm trying to, trying to, it's the life of Christ in you. All right, so just show of hands, how many of you in here have the life of Christ in you? Raise your hand. Okay, that's good. Just checking, because we've got a little cry room back there. I can lead you. <laughs> The, uh, so, so when you get born again, I think everyone pretty much understands that Jesus is in them, right? He's in there somewhere. But that's not the same thing as number four. Number four is when you begin to realize that it's not I but Christ, okay? It's not I but Christ. The life is no longer my life, it's his life, okay? So that's a, that's a true progression, it's a true progression. And so with that, there is a whole learning area that, uh, of discovery, particularly in the scriptures, where you begin to go, okay, you know what? Uh, this scripture also is bearing witness to that, that it's not my life, it's his life, okay? So... But in many people's minds, whether they know it or not, they're still kind of saying, I still live, but I have Jesus in there, and it's his life now, and that's the life I'm supposed to live. Can you see that? Is it possible you're doing that? Anyway, it is, it is a real possibility, but it's okay in one sense. It can be a progression, and I think it was for me. I think it was for me. I think long before I really, really grasped the crucified life, not long before, but that uh, I began to understand, oh, my God, it's his life. And then when I saw scriptures and then more scriptures, I began to embrace that more and more and more and say, you know, not I, but Christ, it's his life. And um, <clears throat> so with that, it was, it was like there was no real, um, you, you remember John the Baptist said, um, he must increase and I must decrease. It was kind of like a view of he must increase, but there's no thought of my decrease. 
just, yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of, it's not even a, a thing yet about decrease. Maybe it, the scripture can be quoted with that, but that may be even quoted with um, Christ being revealed more in the scriptures or from being revealed in the scriptures more in me. Um, but somehow the, the decrease is happening strictly because I'm seeing stuff in the word. You, you see what I'm saying? Like every time I see Jesus in the word as my life, I assume that that's causing a decrease when in reality, I'm just laying hold of the increase of Christ in the word and my understanding of it. And then also saying, while it may not be an increase of him, it is a, um, a, a um, like an establishment more and more and more that he is my life. Based on what? Not, not manifestations of his life, but how many times I've seen him in the scriptures in different places. Can you kind of see that? Yeah, yeah. And so it's like, oh man, I'm really growing. Well, no, you're really dead, but okay. You see what I'm saying? You're missing a major piece and you're spending good years and that's, that's fine as long as you keep moving but some people don't. They stop right there and they make it all about the revelation of Christ, but it's not the revelation of Christ in them. It's the revelation of Christ in the scriptures. And they genuinely assume that every time they see Jesus in the scriptures in a new way as their life, that that automatically causes a decrease when in reality, your life has been all the way through this thing and it's still holding on in the background. Okay? And so that's like disappointing. <laughs> that's disheartening. Uh, but, but if a person doesn't know it, they, go, they go, can go along for years because they feel really, really good. Man, I mean, look, the Holy Spirit's showing me Jesus in the Word, you know. And um, so that's got to be that's got to be it. Well, it is it, but there's an, the the other factor that makes it fulfilled or filled full, and that factor is moving to the next phase, the crucified life. <clears throat> okay, so what's the difference between? the Christ life and the crucified life. Not really in this, because we've even talked about this being the same thing, but in this li list, okay? Remember, we're just sticking with this list right now. What's the difference, or what's one of the differences between the Christ life, or Christ being our life, like that, it's better said, Christ being our life, and the crucified life? Kelly? A little louder. Okay. A real decrease of us. All right. So let's talk about that then. Um, the committed life. The committed life will grab the scriptures that say that Jesus says, you know, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. And they will use that to commit their life. They will deny themselves of things. Well, I'm going to leave my country and I'm going to leave this and I'm going to all the things that I enjoy and I'm going to deny myself of those things. But Jesus didn't say deny yourself of things. He said deny yourself, okay? But that's not all he said. He said, and take up your cross. So you're going to end up down here at the crucified life no matter what, you know? And your commitment is going to, can I say it like this, fall away and the reality of the nature of the lamb is going to be your commitment level. The committed life may com be committed to the sending church, the church that sent them, right? Or the denomination, right? But the crucified life 
is Christ, the Lamb, committed to the Father. It's not, it's not based on us. We're all trying to, see, everyone's trying to be something within these things. And uh, in reality, they're all fulfilled in Christ. But more than just Christ, Christ crucified. So um, the committed life is just wrong because there's only one committed life, and it's Christ. And, and, and if we're calling it our life, the committed life, then we've missed the main point that we're dead. We're dead with Christ. And, I mean, you can argue all you want, but if you do, it proves that you're not dead. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, well, because I know I... I, I <laughs> I argued some of these things. You know, <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, well, what about, you know, I mean, what about me? Well, what about you? <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, aren't you a vessel? Aren't you a body for Jesus? Aren't you a branch for Jesus? Aren't you, all of those things represent just being the vessel of the life. That is, that gives itself. Okay, so, um, so when you begin to discover the crucified life, one of the things that happens, or, well, let me ask again before I say anything else, um, and that was a good one that you brought up, but what is the, what are, what's the difference between the Christ life as we're talking about, the life of Christ in us, and the crucified life. What's another difference? Anybody? Mallory? Right. Good. Yeah. Yeah, she said that there's, there's, you know, we, in, with Christ's life, well, there's direction or things that he's telling you and do this or whatever, and, and you know that it's really his life more than your life, but the Christ life always is tried by fire. That's the very nature of it. You'll never find it in all the blessed times. Uh, I've, I've said many times, and I, I realized this when I was in Bible school, it hit me like lightning hit me. And I thought, oh, my God, if the cross never happened, we would never have known that God was a lamb. It, there wasn't enough. Because anybody could have done this or done this or gone through this trial or, you know what I'm saying? And, and you know. But at the cross, and, and anybody, and especially if they had power to get out of it. Hello. Because every one of us have, at one time or another, had power to get out of something, and we used it. So there's part of that, 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 you know, like you said, they'll come out on the other side the same lamb, the same spirit. That's what Mallory said. Absolutely. And that's, that's. I mean, really, in a certain sense, that's completely different than just having seen that Christ is your life and, you know, it's him that lives and, you know, there's no, it's almost like there's no ground to walk in with that. It's just ethereal. Christ is my life and everything. But you start getting into the reality of the crucified life, that's where the rubber meets the road. That's where everything will start getting practical, you know. And, and, of course, um, with that is this son right here, the crucified life, this son, this lamb son, if I will, is the one that he wants out of us. Okay. So I think we were praying the other night or something, and, you know, I was uh, talking in, my, in the prayer about <clears throat> the sweet savor of Christ rising. But that sweet savor, go back to the Old Testament where the, the whole concept came from, and it only came from off an altar when, when a lamb was given in death. And it says it became a sweet savor unto God. 
And, but we walk around in Christianity and we say, well, I just, I want to do this for you. I want it to be a sweet savor of Christ. But there's no death. It's just, just you know, we feel philanthropic. If I can say philanthropic, I can say subtly, okay? <laughs> no, he's going, I don't know if you can or not. Come on, tell me that I'm good. Tell me I'm really special. <laughs> Let's just go completely against everything I'm preaching right now. <laughs> yeah, Kelly? Right. Okay, so let's, so Kelly said the crucified life, it's death, that's what it's all about. But is it really, I mean, I know, yes, you're right, and I'm not contradicting, but wait, is it really about death? Or is it about the sweet savor in which it gives itself? The attitude, the laying down for others, the not fighting, the, I, I, had a, I had a wonderful statement, golly, Deb, you want to go in, and, we did this last week too, you want to go get my phone, I think it's laying on top of my desk in there, um, I was looking at a, um, a box in uh, Arizona that had, something had come in it, and uh, one of the words on it was omen, and, you know, it wasn't anything scary or whatever. <clears throat> but uh, I just, you know, I've always thought of it as a, an omen as something that was a negative thing. But there also have been, you know, omens that were supposedly good signs of stuff. So I'm really not sure exactly. Here, hand it to me right here. Why don't you go all the way around, and I'm just kidding. Thank you. Sweet lady. Thank you for always doing this crazy stuff for me. Oh, Lord, help me find it right here. There it is. <laughs> An omen. An omen is a phenomenon that is believed to foretell the future, often signifying the advent of change. People in ancient times believed that omens bring a divine message from their gods. These omens include natural phenomena, for example, an eclipse, and I'm going to add in earthquake, abnormal births of animals and humans. And the last one is, and behavior of the sacrificial lamb on its way to the slaughter. Oh my Lord. Like what is it doing, resisting going? You know what I'm saying? It's, it's you know, fighting the, the death maybe? This is a bad omen. <laughs> is that crazy? This wasn't, this wasn't a Christian, I don't even remember. I just looked it up, you know, I went probably the first thing, Wikipedia or something like that, but I was blown away. The behavior of a lamb on the, a sacrificial lamb on the way to the altar, how it behaves. If it's peaceful and going there, you know, and just lays down and dies, that's one thought. If it's resisting and fighting, that's a bad omen. <laughs> that just blew my mind. I'm glad some of you are impressed because I couldn't believe that that was going to end up there with the lamb. Anyway, so we're talking about what? The spirit and the nature in which it dies, not just death. So let me say this again, although I've, you know, I just need to, it's not death. It's not death. It's not always death. It leads to death or it leads to self-giving on some level. It can lead to loss, but it's the spirit in which it is 
given. And that spirit, that the, the only spirit, the only one who is that way is the Lamb of God himself. So it's going to take him within us to bring that about. Okay? So let me just wrap this up since we're getting short here. The difference between the Christ life, not, not in terms of the way we've been teaching it in class, but in terms of just Christ being revealed in us, and we go, Jesus lives in me, and he's the life, and it's not me anymore. If you can't say it's not me anymore unless you move to the Christ life. The only way it's not you anymore is, you know, I'm crucified with Christ. Okay? Now, the final thing is the crucified life, which we've, we've already addressed, but I think it needs to be kind of emphasized, is it is identified by certain things. Okay? No malice. No uh, uh, resistance, no uh, thought of retaliation. Folks, this is a bigger thing in the New Testament than you can imagine. It's in there over and over and over. Okay? Somebody ought to just dig them all out and plaster them on that wall over there because it's not just a small thing in the corner in the New Testament. It is found in so many books of the Bible. And, and it all has to do with this spirit, this way of doing it, this, this um, um, uh, for the lack of a better way of saying it, this sweet savor that the Father gets out of it. Because, he, you know, I mean, look through the scripture. He hates self-centeredness. He hates pride. He hates... You know, all this stuff, right? We know that. We go, well, God doesn't like that, okay? But he doesn't love humility, and he doesn't love self-giving. He loves his son who is not only can humble himself, but, folks, was humiliated by mankind in his death. Humiliated publicly, made a show openly of him and it was a sweet savor to the father okay and that's where the sweet savor there is no so there is no sweet savor just from the Christ life or, or Christ being your life well I just walk around wolfing wolfle dusting the the sweet savor of Christ probably not you don't you know <laughs> I'm pretty sure you don't <laughs> It, it requires an altar, and it requires Christ. It requires the right lamb. And you get the right lamb, oh, it's going to be a good omen because he's going to go in the right spirit to that altar, and it will signify change. <laughs> Isn't that great? Well, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time. We ask you to continue to help us to understand. We look to you and your spirit. We don't claim that we understand everything. We just claim that you've given us the Holy Spirit to teach us Christ, and through him we can begin to grasp who it is that lives in us and how he wants to live. So we entrust all of this uh, into your hands and into your heart. We thank you for it in Jesus' name.